I want to thank all of you who have joined me, not just on this video, but also on this channel just in general in 2019. I'm really excited for what 2020 is going to bring. But for now, Happy New Year, and I'll see you in January. Sorry for jinxing this year, everyone. Yeah, I'm not gonna sugarcoat it. This wasn't a good year. I'm not gonna tell you why, you were all there. The past year has been a depressing slog and you could feel its effect no matter who you are, where you're from, or what field or industry you're a part of. But music? had a pretty all right year. Well, even then I should specify, recorded music had a pretty all right year. Live music is stuck in the hell dimension for the foreseeable future, but it was a good year for albums, EPs, and singles. I don't think 2020 matched the sheer volume of quality stuff that 2019 had, but all things considered, it could have been much worse, and I'm happy with what we did get. As with my previous lists, I'll ask that you not hold me to these specific rankings. These are my 10 favorite albums of the year, but them being placed in a numerical hierarchy is just because I find the format to be pretty fun. I also encourage all of you to leave your favorite albums in the comments and check out the Spotify playlist I made containing all of the songs mentioned in this video in the description. Enough with the setup, let's move past this year. Drum roll please. Number 10. Actually, no, let's wind the clock back to late 2019 and talk about Uncut Gems. Uncut Gems is a very peaceful movie that did not make me feel anxious in any way. It also made me say the phrase, Adam Sandler deserves an Oscar without causing me to gag. But it also features a sizable cameo from a musician who, during the year the movie is set, had just released a trilogy of critically acclaimed mixtapes. It's this guy, The Weeknd. What the f is the weekend. He's gonna be major, even though he's from Canada. This guy yeah. looks stupid. Boy, I bet Howard Ratner would be feeling pretty dumb this year. If, you know, he was a real person. I've been dodging death in the six speed. Amphetamine got my stomach feeling sickly. Abel Tesfaye has spent nearly a decade making music as The Weeknd, about half of it as an internet sensation off of the success of his mixtape trilogy, and the other half as one of mainstream pop's darkest, most lurid performers. His albums since his breakout mixtapes have tried to balance his signature lyrics and production with pop sensibilities, and the results have varied, but for my money, he finally nailed the balance with this year's After Hours. First off, this thing sounds immaculate. This was one of the many 80s inspired pop albums to come out this year, but this may have been the only one that really sounded like a big budget album from that time. Tracks like Hardest to Love, In Your Eyes, the title track, all harken back to a time when an artist had limitless money at their disposal and also drugs. Speaking of which, Abel's lyrical focus is still on sex, partying, and drugs, this time set against the hedonistic backdrop of Las Vegas. But even with the gaudy sights and sounds, it only serves to heighten the remorse within Abel's voice, more so than any weekend record in years. For the first time, it's as if he's saying, no, this is not fun. Sex and drugs and partying are not fun. Why am I doing this? <laughs> I'd be a fool if I didn't specifically mention one of the biggest songs of 2020, Blinding Lights. The first time I heard this, I thought, really, guys? Come on, this is just a cheap ripoff of, uh, the, that, that one song, you know, which one was it? And so I went looking for that one song. And it does kinda sound close to other songs, Take On Me or one Rod Stewart song, but not the one I was thinking. Then I realized, Abel and Co. had written a song so perfect in its hookiness and simplicity that the fact that it hasn't existed for years by now is a tragedy. After Hours is a total win-win. It has some of the catchiest pop songs of the weekend's whole career, and yet it doesn't sacrifice any of his mystique and grit. It's the best encapsulation of the weekend, and even though he's been around for a decade, it feels like he's only getting started. In other words, This is me. This is how I win. Number nine. Look, I don't want to say Charlie's going to be the first artist in the history of this channel to make my top 10 albums list two years in a row, but... I think I want to say it now. I 
got pictures in my mind I can see it so clearly see it all so bright I see you when I British pop star Charlie XCX landed on my list last year with her star-studded, self-titled record. And this year, she's making my list again with How I'm Feeling Now, a record that is almost the exact opposite. I mean, while still being a Charlie XCX album, it's not like she got into polka all of a sudden. Speaking of things that happened all of a sudden, the novel Coronavirus. How I'm Feeling Now is often dubbed the first major quarantine album. Charlie made it over the course of six weeks while at home. As such, it feels like the ying to Charlie's yang. Whereas Charlie felt like the biggest hyperpop party ever thrown, How I'm Feeling Now is like wanting to go to that party, but not being able to. It is a record that deftly captures a feeling of looking from the outside in, or at least what the outside used to be. The best example of this is C2.0, a reworking of Charlie's click. That song was about pulling up to the club and popping bottles with your posse. C2.0 has a whole section with Charlie repeating, I miss them, I miss them every night on loop. But even with that pervading sense of longing, Charlie and producer A.G. Cook managed to craft bop after bop after bop. The production this time feels rougher and blown out, and Charlie's talent as a vocalist shines more than it has on any record of hers so far. I may not be able to lose my mind over bangers like Forever, Visions, and Anthems in a live setting at the time of recording this, but it's nice to know I can share that crazy feeling with many others, including Charlie herself. And hey, isn't music supposed to bring us together? Great record. Number eight. You know what? I'm not done setting records with my lists. I really debated on whether or not to put this next album on here because I've basically never mentioned it on this channel, and because it kind of isn't an album, at least in the traditional sense. But you know what? It's 2020, the rules don't matter anymore, and to omit this album would mean I'd be dishonest about a good chunk of my listening this year, so here goes. For the first time in Mike the Snare history, a slot on my year-end list is going to a video game soundtrack. Okay, let me explain myself. Back in February 2020, when places and things still existed, some friends took me to video game convention PAX East. I played board games, saw my musical inspiration in the flesh, or fur in this case, and played a demo of a game by a brand new Malaysian game studio, No Straight Roads. Jump to August, places and things no longer exist, the game is released, and I decide to pick it up. The plot of No Straight Roads follows musicians Mayday and Zook as they overthrow an EDM empire with the power of rock. Which, yes, does sound like the deranged power fantasy of an indie rock blog circa 2011, but the game eventually reveals itself to be a celebration of all different kinds of music. And the best proof of that is its soundtrack. The main focus of the game are these boss battles against the musical elites of the city, and all of their themes slap so hard. The K-pop boy band homage of Versus 1010, the meter-shifting chill wave of Versus Eve, the orchestral EDM mashup of Versus Yinu, and Versus Subatomic Supernova is the greatest track Jamiroquai never wrote. What's more, the game reflects your beating the bosses by changing the tune from whatever genre they represent to rock which means the soundtrack gives you at least one different version of each boss theme. Not only does this give you more songs, but it shows just how earwormy these melodies can be and how well they work regardless of the genre they're placed into. Even outside of the bosses, the songs for the hub world, your home base, had me nodding my head way more than they had any right to. Wow, Mike, if you love the soundtrack this much, that means you love the game, right? Uh... It, it, it's good. Allow me to briefly turn into plug the controller for a second, because NSR The Game is a solid beat-em-up with a vibrant art style, tasteful world building, and engaging boss battles. That said, there is a steady undercurrent of jank to this game. Controls can feel floaty, audio and visual hiccups pop up frequently, these rap battle minigames need to jump off a cliff. I'll also say I played this on my Switch, and I'm fine with some downgrading in my ports if it means I can play them anywhere, but without going into spoilers, by the time I hit the end, there were sections where I felt like I was playing an alpha build. So do I recommend the game? Maybe? I'll acknowledge part of my purchase was because I wanted to support this new studio and because I want more games to have this level of passion behind them. Do I recommend the soundtrack though? Absolutely. It's on streaming services, it's 10 bucks on Bandcamp, and it feels like it should be way more. Plus, if you get the album, you won't have to play these horrible mini games. Like, how do you expect one person to do this? Number seven.
I'll be honest with you all. I knew I wanted to put the self-titled album by British songwriter Lien Le Havis on this list as soon as I heard it, but when it came to actually, you know, express why, I had a hard time with it. I still do. There's no great narrative to it. I mean, it's been described as a song cycle about the path of a relationship, as viewed through the eyes of nature taking its course. There's no crazy guest stars or tabloid drama with it. It's just songs that are written well and then played well. Leanne is a gifted vocalist and musician, and she and the rest of the band have such a dynamic chemistry that the simple act of hearing them play is a joy and a comfort. The result is a collection of songs that are excellent just because they are. Of course Read My Mind has a captivating chord progression and one of the catchiest builds I've heard in ages. Of course Sour Flower takes a 5-4 time signature and overlapping vocals and makes one of the best album closers of 2020. Of course Bittersweet sounds good, whether it's performed by a full-on orchestra or just Leanne and a guitar. Of course all of these things are true. How could they not be? I also need to shout out her cover of Radiohead's Weird Fishes, which is my favorite cover of 2020. You want to know why I think this is such a good rendition? It's because of one change that you hear right at the beginning. You hear that change in the beat? Instead of the driving momentum of Radiohead's original, we get this sultry, restrained beat. The result is a first half that feels more intimate, and a second half where the climax feels so much more powerful. Excellent cover, excellent album. Number six. Ah, uh, shoot. Sorry, it's just, I realized if I'm not done with this list in the next couple of minutes, I'm gonna fall behind on my schedule that I've kept for most of this year. So, um, yeah, let's, let's get through this next pick. Phoebe Bridgers dropped her first album in 2017, but it's not like she's disappeared in the years since. She joined forces with Julian Baker and Lucy Dacus for that phenomenal Boy Genius EP. She made a whole album with Connor Oberst. She popped up on songs by The National in the 1975. All of that experience coalesced into her second album, Punisher, a record about trying to grow past trauma amid a world consumed by trauma. I wonder why this record resonated with so many people in 2020. Phoebe's lyricism is the kind that manages to find universality within the specific. It's the details that matter most, and they range from the intimate to the morose to the outright hilarious. Phoebe imagining a conversation with Elliot Smith on the title track, fighting with a partner about John Lennon to the point of tears on Moonsong, planting a garden after a skinhead neighbor goes missing on Garden Song, these songs feel like the lived experience of someone trying to grow into the best or even just a better version of themselves. Musically, the soundscapes on display here rely more on submerged textures, which allows Phoebe's voice to pierce through. Of course, this also means the explosive moments stand out even more, like on Kyoto and Chinese Satellite. And it all culminates in I Know the End, which... You know what? I don't even want to spoil this one, so please, if you haven't, go listen to it. Go listen to the whole album, too. But, like, not right now, because I've, I've still got half a list to get through. Now we tune it down, and the drum sounds like... Number five. If you've been watching this channel for a while now, you might have caught me wearing this Mets visor, uh, typically to designate another version of myself for lighthearted conversations. Oh boy, you mean like me? Did I say you could speak? Now's a good time to tell you all, I have not followed the Mets in years. Uh, so out of curiosity, I looked into their past few seasons, and um... They haven't been doing too hot, have they? Their 2020 season has been especially rough, given how much potential they had at the start of the year. It made me realize everyone has that someone or something that gave you such joy at one point, but has perhaps disappointed you time after time again. There's a band that has embodied that feeling in recent years, but this year, boy did they deliver. Up on his horse, up on his horse. Four years after their last release, and seven years since their last full-length album, New York rock stalwarts The Strokes returned with the new abnormal. Okay, even before a worldwide pandemic, that title is ridiculous. Some strange, strange times. You're painting and morphing into your head. Exactly. The first single from this record was At The Door. What a weird move, right? You're gonna pick a single with no percussion, a three minute long outro, and the same synths from Usher's DJ Got Us Falling In Love?
but it showed the band weren't afraid to take these kinds of dramatic risks, and while the rest of the record isn't as daring as that song, it manages to be the best collection of songs the band has released in years. The Adults Are Talking highlights the band's knack for guitar interplay, Eternal Summer is the finest jam in the band's catalog, Ode to the Mets would be the best bar sing-along song of the year if singing in bars wasn't a health risk, Julian Casablancas' falsetto gets a chance to shine on Selfless and Why Are Sundays So Depressing, and some might say, including the Strokes lawyers, that Bad Decisions borrows heavily from both Modern English and Billy Idol, to which I say, yeah, that's why it's great. Last Night was great, and it borrowed heavily from Tom Petty's American Girl. The Strokes have always excelled at repackaging old rock tropes and creating something that feels new. It's how they rose to fame, for heck's sake. All right, I've done it. I have now set the world record for longest time spent talking about The Strokes without bringing up Is This It or Room on Fire. Oh. Oh, thank you. Thank you all so much. Oh, it's an on. Oh my gosh, look, a JPEG of an award. Yeah, I figured this would have to come up eventually, but the Strokes have spent almost 20 years living in the shadow of their star-making record and its follow-up, and I think they've spent the years since trying to make good on that indescribable hype with varying results, but I also think they finally figured out how to make a proper follow-up to Is This It? The answer is... you don't you make something else. You make something that takes input from each band member and their own various interests and side projects, and you have the most unified version of a Strokes album to be released since their heyday. It's nice to see them hit a home run again. Number four. Is Fiona Apple on the list yet? Well, get those damn bolt cutters and get her on here. Legendary songwriter Fiona Apple made her return this past April with Fetch the Bolt Cutters, and the response it received was nothing short of rapturous. Rave reviews from many publications, including the first perfect score from Pitchfork in nearly a decade. But hold on, Fiona may have gotten past these hotshot publications, but can she get past a YouTuber? Yeah, she can. This thing's pretty damn great. First, the qualities you might expect from a Fiona Apple album are here in full force. The piano work on tracks like The Opener and Shamika represents some of Fiona's best playing. Fiona's voice is still one of the most dynamic in music today, at one moment intimate and the next howling, like on Cosmonauts, and the lyricism is consistently engaging, often clever, and occasionally devastating. A certain line about a bed on For Her comes to mind. But what really cements this album as one of the the best of 2020 is the percussion. Fiona's last record, The Idler Wheel, the percussion on that record sounded like random objects found in a junkyard, and Bolt Cutter's percussion sounds like those junkyard objects come to life, devouring anything that gets in their way. As the album progresses, the tracks become more reliant on the percussion, and in turn, Fiona's singing becomes more layered, more rhythmic, and almost tribal. The result is songs like Relay, Newspaper, and On I Go that sound like ritualistic sacrifices. It is a wholly uncompromised, animalistic album, and it is phenomenal. Kick her under the table all you want, she won't shut up. Number three. Oh, wait. I realized I missed the chance to do a cool little joke about the numerical order, because the last spot was number four, and this next record is... La, la. Looking for M's like I lost a friend. Jump out of my bed like where the bread. You go hold the egg. Way to bring the check. LP and Killer Mike returned in 2020 to make us all run naked backwards through a field of dick with their fourth self-titled record, Run the Jewels 4. Their latest followed numerous instances of black people being unjustly killed by police and the mass social upheaval that followed. They have a really good habit of timing their records with times of great societal upheaval. Or events like this happen so frequently that they could release an album whenever and it'll probably be close to some grave injustice. I mean, when Killer Mike writes a verse talking about being held down by police and whispering I can't breathe in November 2019 and drops said verse in June 2020 immediately after a man's murder made news with those being his last words, 
I'd be impressed if it wasn't so depressing. But somehow, Mr. P and Mr. Mike manage to thread the needle when it comes to powerful statements on society, or more accurately, lob the thread between each other through the needle. There are certain things you can be sure of in this life, and one of them is the joy of hearing LP at Killer Mike exchange verses. Opener Yankee and the Brave episode four highlights this beautifully, imagining the two as bank robbers with LP pleading with Mike not to take his own life when they're surrounded by cops. Exhilarating stuff. But along with dropping bars, you know what else they have a really good habit of doing? making great bangers. Take the immediacy of Run the Jewels 2 with the more adventurous production of Run the Jewels 3 and you get what might be their best album to date. Whether they're teaming up with Pharrell and Zack De La Roca on Just, or flipping a gang of four sample on the ground below. And let's not forget the album's closing thesis, a few words for the firing squad. The duo look back on their lives and careers and prepare to face whatever comes next, set to a cavernous wall of sound and Kochema Gastelum shredding on the sax. RTJ5 cannot come soon enough. Number two. So recently, Pantone announced the color of 2021, if you will. And this year, they named two. The first was yellow, and the second was gray by Moses Sumney. A bit weird to make a piece of music one of your defining colors, but I mean, hey, it's not like it isn't deserved. Though, now that I think about it, limiting an album like Moses Sumney's sophomore effort to just one shade seems like it misses the point of the album. First off, Grey isn't one album, it's technically two. The first part, which was already album length, was released in February, the second released in May. Second, to designate this album to just one genre or classification would be a low-key fool's errand. One might call it an R&B album, but how does that explain acoustic guitar-led tracks like Polly and Keeps Me Alive? How does that explain the berating percussion of Viral and Conveyor, the orchestral flourishes of Cut Me and Bless Me? Grey is an album that defies sonic categorization, and I love it for that. By creating a prismatic meld of genres, not only does it allow Moses and company to explore whatever sounds they want, but it also reinforces Moses' lyrics on the confines of masculinity and breaking free of the labels others place on you. It reminds me a lot of The War on Drugs, A Deeper Understanding, in that it works best when you sit with it for a long period of time and allow different tracks to come and go in your listening. One day you'll be transfixed by the one-two punch of conveyor and boxes. For real, Ian Chung is such a good drummer and those vocal effects, good lord. Another day you'll be drawn into the middle stretch of Two Dogs, Bystanders, and Me in 20 Years, which fully showcase the absolute military-grade weapon that is Moses Sumney's voice. It is a fully realized vision and it gives you the kind of feeling you get when you really get to know someone beyond the surface level. During a year when our connections with others were tested more than ever, I was and am very thankful for Moses' reminder of the value of connecting with the self. Before we get to number one, here are 10 honorable mentions. Don't show up. Oh, this one hurt to cut. It got pushed out at the very end, but that does not diminish one of the best pop albums of the year and a star-making turn for Dua Lipa. Same with Dua, this one sucked to cut. But Rina Sawayama's debut album was another excellent pop record, one that combined pop traits from the past three decades into something fresh. I can't wait to see what she does next. The isolated nature of 2020 meant that dense, detail-packed albums had a chance to really shine. On an unrelated note, here's Sufjan Stevens' latest electro-pop opus. The first group to make my honorable mentions two years in a row. Clipping cemented their place in hip-hop this year with the rare horror sequel to match its predecessor. Vintage tea. Okay, yes, I'm a simple man. I see Aaron Desner from The National producing. I like it. But it helps that Folklore features some of Taylor Swift's best hooks, as well as some of her most mature and captivating songwriting. Evermore was pretty good too. Every time I think that I've been taken With Women in Music Part 3, the Heim sisters got a little bit looser, a little more laid back, and a little more honest. The end result was their best album, and one that made a socially distant summer a little more bearable. 
the latest album to be featured on this list, and an excellent reminder of why we shouldn't be putting out these lists until the year's basically done. The Avalanches came through with a kaleidoscopic ride through space, along with a cavalcade of guest stars. And speaking of guest stars... Damon Albarn and Jamie Hewlett tossed aside any notion of a narrative with their cartoon band and assembled the largest guest list seen on a Gorillaz record since 2016's Humans. That album was bloated. This one is their best in a decade. Funny how that works. I didn't get to Ali X's latest until this December, and my reaction was pretty succinct. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> wow, wow, wow. <laughs> I'm gonna be real with you, there were a ton of great albums released in the first quarter of this year, but when I put an album on this list, it comes with the implication that I listened to it over the course of the year, and due to... I re-listened to virtually nothing released between January and March 20th. Which sucks because a lot of good stuff came out. Caribou, Spanish Love Songs, Grimes, Destroyer, the posthumous Mac Miller, not you. Even that Tame Impala record that most people were lukewarm on. A lot of good stuff that, for reasons far beyond the artist's control, I had no desire to revisit. Also, if you're wondering why that date is so specific, it's because this year can be accurately divided as pre- and post-Animal Crossing New Horizons. And now... Let's finish this. Number one. I try each year to come up with a theme that ties all of my favorite albums together. Uh, this year, the best one my tired ass mind could come up with was relief. 2020 was a rough year, and everywhere you looked, it seemed like things could go nowhere but down. So for me, music was an all but necessary way to escape from the stress and find some kind of catharsis. All of the albums I've listed so far gave me that feeling of relief, but when it came to the album that gave me that feeling the most, there was really only one choice. Eve Toomer called this record heaven to a tortured mind, and if this is what heaven sounds like, I'm never sinning again. With this album, Toomer has unleashed the rock god within them, pulling from rock of decades past, as well as their past experimental work, and drenching it in pure psychedelia concentrate. Imagine if Prince fronted Tame Impala, and then sprint to your nearest streaming platform and or music retailer to experience this. I dare you to find a record from 2020 that was this laser focused, this consistent, in its euphoria. Listening to this front to back is a chaotic, cathartic joyride, a deft balance of melody and noise. On one end, tracks like Medicine Burn and Folier Impose throw sonic layer on top of sonic layer to great claustrophobic effect. On the other end, Hostile in Lights and Strawberry Privilege create these flourishing soundscapes that you can't help but get lost in. And when that perfect middle is met, you get tracks like Gospel for a New Century, Superstars, and the monstrous barn burner of a jam that is kerosene. These are the kind of tracks that you would want to have blaring at any house party, but then you realize you can't do that because hell world, and then you get mad, and you know what? These tracks work just as well when you want to just scream at the universe. In just 36 minutes, Eve Toomer creates a sonic labyrinth that leaves you surprised, delighted, and cleansed. Heaven to a Tortured Mind is the kind of record that demands you fully lose yourself in it. The kind of record that reminds you of music's ability to achieve pure, unbridled catharsis, and a stunning reminder that sometimes you just have to shut up, sit back, and let music do its work. I want to thank all of the artists whose work I've highlighted in this video for making such great albums during such a turbulent year. I encourage all of you to check them out, and if you're able to, please consider supporting them or any other artists you've enjoyed in 2020 by buying vinyl, CD, a piece of merch. I don't want to say anything that'll jinx us for 2021, so all I'll say is happy holidays, stay safe out there, wear a mask, and thanks for watching. I'll see you in the new year.